Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to our Tuesday night Bible study. Um, we are grateful and thankful that, by God's grace, uh, we are here to serve, and that you are here to be served. We pray that our study tonight will be a blessing to you. Uh, just want to encourage you to continue to be praying for our church family. Uh, there are some among us who are sick, uh, some who are not doing well. So be praying for uh, our body. That the Lord will continue to sustain us. He has been good to us uh, in light of these times. Also, uh, just so you know, I am meeting with some of the leadership on Saturday morning uh, as we continue to discuss and plan our reentry. The Bible uh, clearly affirms that God's people need to be around God's people. And we're not going to allow uh, fear to, pre to prevent us from living out our faith. At the same time, we are not going to be foolish in how we live out our faith. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are preparing and we're diligently working. Uh, and I'm saying we, there are many who are diligently working uh, so that when we do begin to gather again, uh, we will be able to do so safely uh, without any obligations whatsoever on anyone, uh, but just with the intent to provide opportunity uh, to be in the house again. So uh, be listening up for that. Uh, last but not least, well, actually, two things. Uh, let me continue to encourage you to be intentional about your worship on Sundays and even about your time in scripture during the week. Uh, we provide these studies for you during the week uh, so that you can have that midpoint break to go back and consider the truths of God, the word of God uh, throughout the week. So many, so many things occur in the week that draw attention away. So we have to be intentional about our pursuit of God through the study of the Word of God. And then finally, uh, we have to be just as intentional about our worship on Sundays. So let me encourage you to be to be per to purposely set aside a couple hours every Sunday, starting at I would suggest about eight forty-five to, to prepare your hearts and mind, your family, your home, uh, to prepare your devices to worship God with us together virtually. Uh, so just as an encouragement to you, because I understand that the routine of things can become mundane and we can lose focus. So I just want to encourage you uh, in that. And thank you so much for your prayers for us. Uh, so tonight, as you can see, we're doing a little book, Big Message. Uh, what's interesting about our book tonight, uh, it is the largest book of the little, of the, of the little books. So tonight our study is going to be uh, high level, to say the least, where at least I, what I want you to leave with, with the understanding of the purpose of the book of Zechariah within the scriptures. This is the word of the living God. And God has given us this word for a reason. So we're going to pray and then we're going to jump right in. Uh, so our Father and our God, we thank you for this day, for this time, for this moment. Uh, there are people that started off this day with a lot of plans. But you determined that they wouldn't see the end of the day. And yet we are still here. And there's not a person that's still here that remained because of some goodness or merit well, they deserve to still be here. You just chose to show us mercy today. So thank you for bringing us to this time. Thank you for bringing us to this time where we are considering your word, listening to you, hearing from the creator of all things, engaged in the one to whom we will stand before and give an account for every word, thought, and deed. Bless this time. Help us to see you, to understand you, to get a glimpse of your glory, to rejoice in you because of the promises you have made to your people. Thank you for Jesus. It's only because his life, his death, and his resurrection, that we are your people. 
my faith in him. For those who don't know you, bring them to yourself. For those who are wondering, draw them back to you. For those who are weak, strengthen. For those who are afraid, encourage. For those who are guilty, convict. For those who are repentful, forgive. Do this for your people so that we may truly rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Bless our time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, well, as you can see, I have on my Houston Texan jersey. Uh, so you already know who I'm rooting for when football season starts. I'm already prepared and have already been in some heated discussions about what the Houston Texans are going to do this coming year. I haven't seen one practice yet. I haven't even really paid attention to any of the sports uh, broadcasts about the NFL, but I am already Rooting, celebrate, celebrating, and again, having heated debates about why I know the Houston Texans, in the end, will be Super Bowl champions. Now, one practice has occurred, but I'm anticipating celebrating this great quarterback holding up the MVP of the Super Bowl. I know some of you are laughing right now, but that's okay. I am convinced, kind of. In our book tonight, God is going to call his people to do the same thing that I'm doing and many of you are doing about your uh, incompetent teams. where he calls his people to live in their present, but looking ahead for a glorious future. Tonight we're studying the book of Zechariah. For contextual reasons, we know that all of the minor prophets are rooted in the covenant made Moses, the children of Israel. God told them, if you obey me, I'm going to bless you in every aspect of life as a nation of people. He also told them that if you disobey me, curses will come upon you to the degree that you will eventually be removed from the land that I've given you. Why was it important? For Israel to remain faithful to God because God's choice of them was for them to be his possession amongst all the people. For all the earth belonged to him and they were to be his kingdom on, on the planet but also notice a kingdom of priests. And as we have said the purpose of a priest is to represent people before God, but also to represent God before the people and the nation of Israel was to be that on the earth for all the other nations of the world. And all the other nations will come to know Yahweh through them. But as we know, they continually rebelled against God, continually rebelled against him. And God continually sent prophets to them. And they refused to hear the voice of the prophets. And so the northern kingdom, Israel, was split, was taken into captivity in 722 B.C. by the Assyrians. 612 B.C., Chaldeans, Babylonians, captured Nineveh, defeating the Assyrians. And between 605 B.C., 586 B.C., the southern kingdom, Judah, Jerusalem, is taken captive now by the Babylonians. 
Third and final deportation is in 586. The final attack of your siege, the wall is destroyed, the temple is destroyed, and more taken to captive, taken into captivity into Babylon. God determined that this captivity would last 70 years. Here where he says in Jeremiah 25, 11, verse 11, and this whole land shall be a desolation and horror, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And then God in his sovereign power and authority, and again, this connects back to the book of Habakkuk, then it will be when the 70 years are complete, I will punish the king of Babylon. And the nations declare the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans. God promises to deliver his people through another pagan king named Cyrus. So here's the prophecy about Cyrus 150 years before Cyrus even existed. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform my desire. Cyrus is not a believer in Yahweh. He's polytheistic. But God calls him his servant, and he's going to use him to deliver his people. And the, the class of Jerusalem, she will be built. Remember, she was torn down. But he's going to use this king of Persia to begin the rebuilding of of his wall and the temple that was torn down by the Babylonians. So in 539 BC, the Babylonians were defeated by Cyrus, king of Persia. 538, Cyrus began to allow the Israelites to return to their homeland, and 50,000 returned. And notice how the text reads, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, that they were going to be released after seven years, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. God is sovereign. Cyrus, remember, is not somewhere, oh, I just love Yahweh. Cyrus is somewhere worshiping a different God every different day of the week. And yet Yahweh stirs his heart so that he sent the proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing saying thus says king of, of Persia the Lord the God of heaven has given me all the kingdom of the earth has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem which is in Judah so God is you notice the pride that's there God has appointed me to do it right Whoever there is among you of all, notice now, his people. <laughs> May his God be with him. And let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord. The God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And then you see the survivors, they begin to go back. They didn't go back empty handed because if they're going to go back, they have to have wealth, materials to purchase supplies and to build. What does God do? God touches the heart of the Persian's people. So as these slaves are leaving, they give them silver and gold and goods with cattle and with valuables, aside from all that was given as a free will offer. Also, the king Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar took away, gave them back. So now these slaves are walking out with all of this wealth. Why? So they can go back and rebuild God's temple and God's land. His promise land. 536 B.C., the rebuilding of the temple began, but due to opposition, if you remember last week, they stopped building. Because when they got there, you have some fragments of Assyrian people still there. There are some intermingling going on. 
So when God's people come back to us rebuilding, the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building the temple of the Lord God. They have approached the ruler who's like the governor, the head of the father, and they come to them and say, hey, let us build with you. For we, like you, seek your God. And we've been sacrificing to him, you know, from the very beginning. Don't mean that. They showed up to stop them. But Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and the rest of the head of the father said to them, you have nothing in coming with us in building a house to our God. But we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Why did he throw that in there? That's his political power he's using. Then the people of the land, nevertheless, became discouraged. They discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building, and the people stopped building. You remember from last week, 520, 16 years later, God sent Haggai to the people. If you remember, God uses Haggai to tell them, so you allow opposition to stop you from building the Lord's house, but you have no problem building up for yourself some really nice houses. And then he goes on to say, that's why you always seem to not have enough. And things never seem to work out for you because you have gotten all your priorities all messed up. You actually believe that your agenda for you takes precedence over God's agenda for himself. When he, the only reason why he sent you here was for himself. And the truth is, hey, God says, when you put him first, everything else kind of begins to lay out for you. So God says, hey, God. And in the same year, God calls Zechariah to preach to his people. So hey, God showed up first. And then Zechariah is going to come. Why? Because they are going to start and rebuild. But then the rebuilding will slow down again. And God will send Zechariah to them. Zechariah's message is going to be about where they are. But it's about living in the context historically where they were, but looking towards looking for something else. Ezra 5, 1 and 2 says, when the prophet, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edu, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and in Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shelete, and Yeshua, the son of uh, son of J J Josedach arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So the people, when Zechariah hey showed up, they started rebuilding, but the work slowed down. Zechariah shows up, and Ezra says, after Zechariah shows up, they started rebuilding the temple, and what took them 20 years to do, they finished in four years. Because for 16 years, they allowed their priorities to get messed up. Haggai's message caused God's people to refocus their priorities and their heart to continue to build the temple on the basis of God's goodness and promise to bring them back to their land and to be with them. And that's exactly what God did. In the same year, God called Zechariah to preach to his people to continue to rebuild the temple on the basis of God's promise to restore them, but also looking to ultimate fulfillment of the Messiah's coming. So Zechariah's prophet, so, so hey guys, if I can sum it up like this, says, do something about your priorities, put God first, why? Right? Because God has been good to you, why? He has brought you out of captivity back into the land. 
Zechariah prophecy says, God has been good to you. Continue to rebuild the temple. Why? Because not only has he brought you back from the land, but he has something greater for you ahead. The book we're going to divide up into three parts. And you got to stay with me because we're going to talk through these three parts fairly quickly. The three parts, part one, covers chapters one through chapter six. That's part one, chapter one through chapter six. Part two, chapter seven and chapter eight. And then part three, we divided up chapters nine through 14. Part one, chapter one through six, part two, chapter seven, chapter eight, and then part three, chapter nine to chapter 14. There are other more uh, uh, elaborate outlines for the book, but for the sake of time and for the purpose of just ensure that you have an understanding of the book and not just of the book, of the God revealed in the book and what he is saying to his people, uh, we're going we're gonna to divide the book up in a real simple way. So, part one, which covers chapter one through chapter six, we see first God calls his people to remember and to return. And we see this in verses one through verse six. Beginning at verse number two. Verse number one, he introduces the prophet. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet. Verse two, they finna remember the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them, Thus said the Lord of hosts, Notice, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets proclaimed, thus saying, The Lord of hosts, return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. Notice God said prophets, the people didn't listen to the prophets, and that's all of those prophets that we have already studied that they did not listen to. That's why they went into captivity. So God now telling this group, remember what happened to your forefathers. Verse 5, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? Then they repented and said that the Lord of hosts purpose to do to us in accordance with, our, with, accordance with our ways and our deeds, he has so dealt with us. Notice what he says. And all your, fault, your forefathers, what, remember what happened to them? They died. Even the prophets died. But what stood forever? What I said I was going to do. My word. So what's the call? Listen to my word when Zechariah is preaching to you. He calls them, return, he tells them, return to me and I will return to you. Verse 1 through verse 3. He calls them to remember your fathers, their mistakes, their areas, their failures, and how they rebelled against God. As they heard the word of God, they rebelled against God. And then the response of the people, they repented as the Lord had called them. Chapter 1, chapter, chapter 7 through chapter 6, through chapters 8, we will see where, as God calls his people to return to him and the people seems to be listening to, listening to Zechariah. We're going to see in this session God's promise of blessing now and hope later. And he does this through these visions. and Through, through these visions that Zechariah is going to have. The first one is there is a Christophany among the myrtle trees. This is vision one. And there are eight of them. There is a Christophany amongst the myrtle trees. Why do we say a Christophany? And this is in verses 7 to verse 17. And let me, let me just suggest that what he's going to communicate is peace among the nations of the earth. When you come to verses 7 and verse 8, you're going to see where he says, he introduces himself in verse 7, but in verse 8, I saw at night, behold, a man riding on a red horse, and he was standing among, 
amongst the myrtle trees which were in the ravine. So this man is there standing next to this myrtle tree. Verse 9. Then I said, my Lord, what are these? And the angel who was speaking to me says, I will show you what are these. And the man who was standing amongst the myrtle tree answered and said, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. So the so they answered, notice the angel of the Lord who was standing amongst the myrtle trees. So uh, the angel of the Lord, what most scholars will suggest is a reference to, it's a Christophany. It is a, it is a appearance of Jesus before the incarnation. The primary reason, as theologians, this is, this is the primary idea or, or the idea, the belief about it is after the incarnation of Jesus, we no longer see this phrase, the angel of the Lord, at all appears anymore. We see him in different places throughout the Old Testament, but as soon, and every time you see him, he speaks with the authority of God. He doesn't even speak like Gabriel and Michael. Sometimes when we see them speak, other angels speak in the scriptures. No, he speaks with this different authority. And therefore, most suggest that this is a Christophany, an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. And notice he is the one talking amongst the myrtle trees. And in verse number 12, then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem? And the cities of Judah, which you have been indignant these 70 years. The Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me with gracious words, comforting words, so that the angel who was speaking with me said to me, proclaim, saying, Thus is the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. But I am very angry with the nations who are at ease. For while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. And in verse number 16, therefore, thus said the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem, notice, with compassion, my house will be built in. And my cities will again, verse 17, overflow with prosperity, and the Lord again will comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Notice God is promising peace. Then there are the four horns, the judgment on the nations for their evil. Because now God said, I'm going to bring peace to Israel, to Jerusalem, but also I'm going to judge the nations for their evil. Chapter 1, verse 18 through verse 21. Then I would lift up my eyes and look, and behold, there were four horns. So, so I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these? And he answered, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. These the Lord showed me four, then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. I, I said, what or these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man may lift up his head. But these craftsmen have come to terrify them, to throw down the horns of the nations who have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter them. That's God's judgment on the nations. And then there are the measuring line, the third vision, which is the habitation of Jerusalem. And it's an expansion of of Jerusalem. This is vision three, and we're just going to read verses one uh, through, yeah, we'll just read verses one through one, one and two. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked to behold, that was a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, what are you doing? And he said to me to measure Jerusalem to see how wide it is and how long it is. And behold, the angel who was speaking with me going out and another angel was coming out to meet him. He said, Run, speak to that young man, say, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. For I declare the Lord will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. That God is going to expand her, and he will be a monk. He will be doing the expansion. And then there's the restoration of the priestly line. Remember, the, the temple is gone. 
They are rebuilding the temple. And now he says there's going to be a restoration of the priestly line in Joshua. And, and this idea of Joshua uh, in, in, in chapter 3, verses 1. Uh, and we're only going to look at a few verses. But it begins when he sees this, this vision of Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And notice it says, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. So he sees this vision of Joshua who's dressed like a priest standing before God and Satan is standing there saying he's guilty. The idea is it seems to be obvious that Joshua is, rep is a representative of the nation. Remember God just promised I am going to restore Israel. And so now he sees this vision of Joshua who now represents the nation. And guess what Satan is standing there doing? Accusing them. Uh, it, it's a way of saying, you can't do that for Israel because Israel violated your law. They're guilty. Notice how God responds. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand I plucked from the fire? You hear what God says? God never says, Satan, you're wrong. They're not guilty. He never says that. What he says is, I chose him. I chose Jerusalem. And I am the one who plucked them from out of the fire. How does this go to the princely line? Notice verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And again he said to them, see I have taken your iniquity away from you and you will be clothed with festal robes. And then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments with the angel of the Lord. Notice, was standing by. The angel of the Lord, a picture of Jesus, a Christophany. And notice what he says. I plucked him out. And then what does God, what does Yahweh say? Take his filthy clothes that which represented what? His sin. Israel's sin. I am going to give him new clothes. Your sin has been removed. But notice who's standing there. You know what the theology is. That when he took the filthy rags off the nation. You know what the text says? The angel of the Lord was standing by. Because what does the Bible teach? If the angel of the Lord is a Christophany, the picture of Jesus, the filthy rash was placed on him. That the guilt of the nation, sin, the picture of the angel of the Lord, receiving the guilt, the guilt of those whom God has chosen. The angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. If you will walk in my way and I will, if you will perform my service, then you will govern my house and have charge over my courts. So you, he, you see this restoring of the priestly line. And then you see the restoring of the royal line. In chapters 4, verses 1 through verse 14. And you have to catch something here. Chapter 4. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. He said to him, what do you see? He said, I see a lampstand. He see these two olives sitting on it. And then down in verse 5. Drop down in verse 5. So the angel who was speaking to, with, with me answered and said, do you know what these are? No, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to, to the rule, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountains? 
before the rule, you will become a plain and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace and grace to it. Also the word of the Lord came to me, the hands of the rule have laid the foundation of the house. This is the encouragement for the rule to continue to keep building the temple of the Lord. Remember the rule is the governor during this time. But something interesting happens. While God encourages the rule between verses 8 through verse 10 to continue to build verse 11 then I said to him what are these two olive trees in verse 12 and I answered the second time and said to him what are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes which empty the golden oil from themselves so he answered and said do you not know what are these and I said no my lord then he said these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the earth. Now, what is the point he's making? Back up a little bit. He just told us about Joshua, who is representative of what? The priests. Now he's telling us about Zerubbabel, who has this authority to govern and to rule. And this is one of the first times where you see a priest that is representing Israel and a ruler that's representing Israel. It is one of the first pictures where we see where you have a king and a priest ruling and governing. Look again, chapter 3, verse 8. Now listen, Joshua, notice the high priest. You and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed they are men who are, who, who are assembled for behold, I am going to bring forth, watch this, in my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, one on whom stone of seven has, behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declare the Lord of hosts, I will remove the iniquity of the land on that day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite your neighbor and sit under the vine and under his fig tree. So there's this branch that's right in the middle, right in the middle of what? One, Joshua, who represents a priest, and Zerubbabel, who represents what? A royal line. Right in between them, there is this branch under which all will sit. What is this a reference to? This is one of the first time somehow the two offices that was given to Israel, the priesthood and the royal kingly authority somehow will be combined in one person. There's a flying scroll in the next vision, removal of sin from Israel. Chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 4. Then I lifted again my eyes, and behold, there was a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? I answered, the flying scroll. Uh, then he said to me, this is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side and everyone who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side and I will make it go forth, declares the Lord of hosts, and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name and it will spend the night within the house and consume it with its timbers and stone that God is going to purge Israel of sin. Then there's this woman, this picture of this woman in a basket, which represents a removal of sin. And in chapter 5, verses 5 to verse 11, she is a picture of, most would argue, of, of the Babylonians. That she's in this basket, and in this basket she's removed, she's taken away. But her ashes is deemed as pure wickedness. And so they are removed. And then there are the four chariots, which will bring peace among the nations in the earth in chapter 6, verses 1 through verse number 8. So, we got to speed up a little bit. So that's God's promise of blessing now and hope later. How is God going to bring this about? Chapter 6. 
God's person of promise and hope. He has promised them hope and blessing and it's going to come through a person. You gotta catch this. And this person is a king and a priest picture earlier between who? Joshua and who? Zerubbabel. And there's this branch in between them that represents both king and priest. You got to see this. In chapter 6, he sees these, these four chariots, but at verse 11 and verse 12, look at this. Take silver, take gold, make an ornate crown. Right? Make a crown, not a turban. They, they will take a turban and put on the head of a priest. You don't put a crown on a priest. You put a crown on a king. Notice what he says. Make a crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehovah. That notice what he is. He's the high priest. So you have a crown that's put on the head of a high priest. Verse 12. Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, a man whose name, remember from earlier in chapter, chapter 3, whose name is Branch. Oh, I want to make your heart happy. Oh, this, you ought to be thinking about Matthew's gospel right now. You ought to be thinking about Matthew's gospel. They call him Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus, look at this, he will be a priest on his throne. You got a priest that's sitting on the throne of God and the temple of God, and yet he's a king. Remember in the Old Testament law, no king was allowed by law to offer sacrifices. That's how Saul, King Saul got in trouble. That's how uh, King Manasseh got in trouble. They offered, the king went in there and offered a sacrifice. No king was allowed. But this branch is going to be a king and a priest. He is a king in that he has the authority of Yahweh to rule, but he functions as a priest where he can offer sacrifice for, his, for the sins of his people. A priest on the throne. Isaiah chapter 11. You already know this is going, right? Then a shoe was spread from the stem of who? Jesse. Uh, who is Jesse's son? David. Who comes from the seed of David? Jesus. Notice from the stem of Jesse and a what? A branch. From his roots will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Do you remember his baptism? And the spirit descended upon him as a, like a dove. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will be like whoever this branch is, he is going to rejoice and take full pleasure in what? The fear of Yahweh. And he will not judge by what his eyes sees, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness. He will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. And also righteousness will be the belt about his own and faithfulness the belt about his waist. He's this king. You hear this mighty of the nations. This king, this branch. Oh, but catch this. But he's also a priest. Psalms 110. The Lord said to my Lord, listen to this. You see that language? Yahweh says to Adonai. David calls both of them what? Lord. 
The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies a footstool for thy feet. The Lord will stretch forth thy strong scepter from thy young saying, rule in the midst of thy enemies. Thy people will volunteer freely in the days of thy power in holy array. You hear that priestly language? In holy array. From the womb of the dove, thy youth unto thee as the dew the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a what? Priest forever. Notice up here, he just says he's going to rule with a scepter. He's a king. And then talking to the same one says, you are a what? Priest. Oh, oh Lord. This branch is a king and a priest. That hope was in a person. And because of that person, God calls the people to remember his wrath and to respond to his grace. In verses 7, he brings it back to history. Now Zechariah is back. He, he just gave him this glorious picture of this person. Now he comes right back into the time, into that context, and he's looking at them, and he's going to say now, because, what, based on what I just told you, remember God's wrath. And then re respond to God's grace. Chapter 7, verse 1 through 8, he's going to tell him, so don't just be religious because that's not enough. Don't just go through a routine. Chapter 7, and this is that part, part 2. He gets the word in verses 1 and verse 2 and pick up at verse 4. And we're just going to read from verse 4 down to verse 8. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh months, these 70, 70 years, was it actually for me that you fasted? When you eat and drink, do you not eat for yourselves and do you not drink for yourselves? Or neither are these not the words which the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous along with the cities around it and the Negev and the, full head, and the foothills were inhabited? Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus is the Lord of hosts said, dispense, here's what you need to do, dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion to, to your brother, verse 10, and do not oppress the widow or the orphan or the stranger or the poor, and do not devise evil in your heart against one another. But now he's going to tell them to remember in verse 11, 14, but remember, notice, but your forefathers, they didn't pay attention to that. And they would not stop, and they stopped their ears from hearing the word of God. They made their horse like flint. They were stubborn in their rebellion. So that they could not hear the law and the words that the Lord of the host had sent to them by the Spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great wrath came from the Lord upon them. And in verse 14, he says, and that's why I scattered them. But now he says, I will restore you. Chapter 8, verses 1 through verse 8. In verse 1 and verse 2, he hears God gives him the word. And in verse 2, here's what God says. But I am jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath, I am jealous for her. I will return to Zion. I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. It will be there. And there in verses 1 through verse 8, he tells them, I am going to restore you. And in verses 14 and verse 17, his holy call is, now you guys who are now returned back, respond to this grace. Verses 14 through verse 17, thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I purpose to do harm to you and your fathers, provoke me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I have not relented, so I have gained again purpose in these days to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Jerusalem, do, to Judah, do not fear. These are the things which you should do. Here's what you should do because I am going to do good for you now. Look what he says you should do. Speak the truth to one another. This practical. Demonstrate your rejoicing that I am coming to do good by you and give you grace by doing what? Live for me. Tell the truth. Speak the truth to one another. And judgment for peace in your gates. 
Let none of you devise evil in your hearts against the other. And do not love perjury. Do not love deceit and lying. Do not love what's wrong. For all these are things what I hate, declares the Lord. You see what God tells them? Love what I love. Hate what I hate. Respond to my grace. And we're almost done. Then there's part three. God's promise of hope to his people. You gotta catch this. Promise of hope to his people. Chapter 9 to chapter 14. And what he's getting ready to promise them looks not at where they are, but in what's to come. Because from this point, they will never have an official king sitting on the throne again. Yet, as we have already discovered, God has promised that a priestly royal king is going to sit on the throne. Somehow, that hasn't happened yet. And Zechariah is going to call these people, listen to this, from today, 2,500 years ago now, to say live today because of a promise that God has made to you. And here is the promise. Beginning in chapter 9, verse 8, I will, I will remove your enemies. Verse 1, he says, the word of the Lord came. Verse 8, but I will account around my house because of an army, because of him who passed by and returns, and no oppressor will pass over them anymore, for now I have seen with my eyes. You see that? He's telling them, the day is coming when I myself will be there to defend my own people. How, why? Because your king will come to you. Chapter 9, rejoice O daughters of Zion, shout and triumph, O daughters of Jerusalem. You, you, you ought to remember this. Watch this. You ought to remember this. Oh, God. Rejoice, brethren, O daughters of Zion, shout and triumph, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. He is humble. Look how they define the king. Humble and mounted on a what? On a donkey. Even on a coat, the foal of a donkey. Where do you remember that? Where do you remember that in the Gospels? Remember, seven days before Jesus is crucified, he gets up on a donkey, the coat of a donkey. He lays a blanket on it. He rides through the gates of Jerusalem. And what do the people say? Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us now. Why are they doing that? They are fulfilling this passage. They are saying, here he is. Here is the king. The problem is, as we know, only a few days later, they are going to reject their king after they acknowledge him. Here he is. That's why Jesus does what he does with what, what we call the triumphant entry. Here's what he's fulfilling. Notice what the people are supposed to do. Rejoice and do what? Receive their king. And when they receive their king, they are supposed to experience what? Their king who functions as their priest. They don't see that in him. But yet he's going to do that. How? Because he's going to ride in as a king, but he's going to sacrifice his life as a priest. Using what? Their rejection to bring it about. Oh, God is sovereign. But the overarching picture that Zechariah paints is, when your king comes, he's going to care for you. Chapter 10, verse 1. As rain from the Lord at the time of the spring, at, at, at the time of the spring rain, the Lord who makes the storm clouds 
and he will give them showers of rain and vegetation in the fields to each man. That when your king comes, he's going to completely provide for you. Uh, and when your kings come, notice, notice what he's going to emphasize. He's going to come, that he's going to pass on you, but you're going to betray him. Look, here's the betrayal. Here's that betrayal. In chapter 11, verse 7 through verse 13. So I pastured the flock, doomed to slaughter. Here's the afflicted, here's the afflicted flock. And I took for myself two, two staffs. Then I called one favor, and the other I called union. So I pastured the flock. Then I nodded the three shepherds in one month, for my soul was impatient with them, and their soul also, and was weary. Then I said, I will not pastor you. What is to die, let it die. What is to be annihilated, let it be annihilated. And let those who are left eat one another's flesh. I just took my staff and my favor and cut it into pieces to break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. So it was broken on that day. It was broken on that day. And thus the afflicted of the flocks who were watching me realized that it was the word of the Lord. And I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages. But if not, never mind. So they weighed out, look at this, 30 shekels of silver as my wage. Then the Lord said, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was noticed, I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of, of, of silver and threw them to the power in the house of the Lord. Uh, how much money did Judas receive when he betrayed Jesus? He received 30 shekels of silver. King priest shows up, rising, right? they're going to deny him. But he's using their rebellion to function as their priest. But in chapter 12, they are looking to the future. He's going to tell them through this process, the king who comes, but he's also a priest, he's going to remove their sin. Chapter 12, verse 7, verse 9. The Lord also will save the tents of Judah. First, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the heavens of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the heavens of Jerusalem and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. You call that the angel of the Lord again before them. And in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. You will mourn about your rejection of me. He tells them, the day is coming. You're going to mourn about how you rejected me. Verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David, on the, on, on the inhabitants of the Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they, look at this, will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day there will be great mourning. That the day will come when Israel will recognize that Jesus is King Messiah and priest, and we killed our king. And they will look at the one, notice what the text says, whom they what? Pierced. Remember at this time, 2,500 years ago, no one is being crucified. Crucifixion, where you hung somebody on a cross by nailing them, didn't show up until the Romans. <laughs> Look at how God is already saying what's going to happen. And this will ring is, is, hasn't even happened yet. When they look at on return Messiah and say, yes, he was king. He is king. And he is and was our sacrifice. And they will mourn. 
but he will remove their sins. In that day, verse 1 of chapter 13, a fountain will be opened for the house of David, David, and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for impurity. And it will be, notice this language, in that day. You hear Jesus talk about that. In that day. Declare the Lord of hosts that I will cut off all the names of idols from the land, and they will no longer be remembered. And I will also remove the prophets and the unclean spirits from the land. That God is going to remove all of their sin, and God is going to establish his covenant. This is a reference to what? A new covenant. I will bring the third part from the fire. Verse 9, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Notice what God says. Then they will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. Notice who's making all of these determinations. God is. Here's what I'm telling you. None of this stuff has happened yet. As far as we can see in Zechariah's prophecy about what's to come, we can see historically how Jesus fulfilled it in his coming, in his, present, in his presenting himself as king and his dying as priest, using first their praise to demonstrate he is king, and then using their rebellion to fulfill ultimately that he is priest, which is going to be the means through which he is going to establish a new covenant and remove their sin. But the for ultimate fulfillment where they see him and mourn and recognize, oh, this is who he is, None of that has happened yet. But notice verse 9, where they're going to look and say, he's God and he's my, and we are his people and he's our God. And God is saying, this is going to be the result because of what God is going to do. And he says now, and I will come again to you. And we have to read these verses. We have to read these verses. Behold, a day is coming. You hear that? This is future tense. For the Lord will, the day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. What does that sound like? The battle of what? Armageddon. When the king is there in the city, uh, again, to battle the city will be captured, the house plundered, the women ravaged, and the and to have the city as well, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the, Lord, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights against, as when he fights on a day of battle. Notice who's going to do the fight. And notice what's going to happen. Right? It's beautiful. In that day, you, keep, you see that phrase, in that day, in that day, in that day, this is future tense. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Where was Jesus' primary place to get away to? The Mount of Olives. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. You will flee by the valley of the mountain, by the, for the valley of the mountains which reaches there. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake of the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him will come. Now, let me just give you the picture of that. Let me connect that to, to your gospel, right? If you remember, when Jesus teaches the disciples about the end times, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, and he tells them about the end times, and he's going to tell them when the tribulation period, when the Antichrist comes, and the Antichrist is going to start a treaty, break the treaty, he's going to go into Jerusalem, and he is going to unleash an all-out war on the people in Israel. What does Jesus tell them to do? Remember what Jesus told them to do. You have to read it. He told them when you see the great tribulation come, when you see the, the abomination of destination, and we know that's when the Antichrist will go into the temple of God and declare himself as God and unleash this attack against Jews, Israelites. What, is, what does Jesus tell them Israelites to do? Don't go back into your house. If, if you're in the field, don't go back home to get anything. 
Flee to where? The mountains. Run to the mountains. He said, I pray it's not winter, and I, I, and, and I hope you're not praying. I hope you're not with child. But flee to the mountains. When you see it happen, don't go back for anything. Run. Why does he tell them to flee to those mountains? Because notice what Zechariah said. He's going to set foot on the Mount of Olives. It will split. And notice there are people who ran to the mountains earlier. And now what he's telling them to do. When I set foot on the mountains, you come to me. And when I walk down through the eastern gates as God and king over all of creation, you will be with me. I will meet you in the mountains. And you will walk with me. Oh, it's a beautiful picture. Verse 6. In that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day living waters will flow off from Jerusalem. Half of them toward the eastern sea. And the other half toward the western sea. And it will be as summer as well as in the winter. Oh, man. Here we go. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. Over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one. And his name, the only one. Um, Twenty-five hundred years ago. God told these Israelites to live their life 2,500 years ago looking for that day when Messiah, High Priest, King Jesus, who fulfilled, and you saw prophecies fulfilled, when he returns, as he promised he is going to, as Zechariah promised he's going to, to people 2,500 years ago, he told them, God called the Israel to live for that hope. Twenty five hundred years later, God is still telling his people to live for this hope. For the same one. Notice the story has never changed. We today are still living for this same hope. Some may suggest, well, it's taking so long. How do we know it's going to happen? Do you see all the other things God said was going to happen? 500, 600 years before it happened, and it happened exactly the way he said it was going to happen? Guess what? All the rest is going to happen the same way. And now today, oh believer in Jesus, he is still telling you and me to live for the same hope. God never tells me to live the Christian life for to be a good Christian just to be a good Christian so people can say I'm a good Christian. He tells me to live because one day Jesus is going to come back and I'm going to get to see the high priest, the king, the branch. Who is the fulfillment in both. And I'm going to be able to rule and reign with him. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And notice what he says. And such we are. That's what we are right now. For this reason, the world does not know us. That's why you don't fit in. You're not supposed to fit in. The world can't Put their hands on you. Why? Because you're not a child of the world. You're a child of the Father. And everybody's not a child of the Father. This is only for people who God has bestowed a love on. And what was the love he bestowed on them? That they would be called children of God. 
And he says that we are. And for this reason, the world doesn't know us. And that's okay if they don't know us. And if we're ashamed, and if we're persecuted, and if we're insulted, and they tell them that, that, that you're just Christian crazy, and, and you don't make sense, and, and they call you all kind of names, and, and all of that because you don't look like them, and you don't talk like them, and you're not excited about the stuff that excites them. But look what the text said. It didn't know him. That he showed up to his world, to his it didn't know him, so it doesn't know you. And look what he said. But, but love, now we are children of God. And it has not yet appeared, and yet what we will be. But here's what we know. Notice in the text. This is what we know. That when he appears, you see that Zechariah. When he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Now watch this, because we're going to see him just as Zechariah prophesied, and everyone who has this what? Hope. Fixed on who? Him. What happens? What do they do? Purifies himself. Just as he is, he is here. The reason why we seek to live a life that's pleasing to God, because one day we're going to see Jesus. The reason why 2,500 years ago, God used Zechariah to tell these Israelites, live for me, is because one day you're going to see your Messiah. And 2,500 years later, God is still telling us, live for me. Because one day you're going to see me face to face. I'm done. But right now there are folks arguing about which one of their teams is going to win the Super Bowl this year. They argue about passion. Spend their money, their time, their energy, debate, I mean, get like really mad about a team that most of us know we're rooting for teams that ain't got a chance to win. For teams that technically we're not even really a part of. Our names are nowhere listed in their employee roster. Passionate looking forward to cheering on throwing party celebrations to celebrate people who most of us will never know or meet. <laughs> and plan our days around their activity. And here it is, God has let us know him. God has made us part of his household. God has placed us on his roster. He wrote our name in his book and placed us on his team. And now he tells us, live your life for me. Live your life for I'm coming, for my coming. Your football team, not perfect, probably not going to win a Super Bowl. But our king and our priest has already demonstrated we have victory. Live for this hope. Let's pray. Our Father and our God. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Bless your people. Give us something greater to live for than what's under the sun. You said this world is passing away, but our king is coming who has already served us as our high priest through his sacrifice and whom is serving as a high priest now 
for he's interceding for us. And yet he is our king who has made us citizens of his kingdom. Help us to live for that kingdom. To build our lives around that kingdom. To make decisions because of that kingdom. To direct our lives towards that kingdom. Because there we have assured victory and we have full joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for spending time with us. Live for this hope. May God bless you.